Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 24 playthrough of the Buffalo Wings, the expansion Buffalo Wings. And we are doing a complicated expansion here. Uh, thank those of you who are watching for your patience in me getting this series out there and making sure everything worked correctly before I started posting episodes. And thank you also to everyone who has given me ideas on what to do for this long-term playthrough, uh, both recently after our Cincinnati Reds series concluded, and quite honestly over the last several months. Um, I have enjoyed the input. I have uh, thought about all of it. Uh, obviously, I've gone in the direction that I decided to go in. And if you're watching right now, I hope that you'll uh, join us for the rest of this series and uh, whatever this experience with the Buffalo Wings ends up being. We just concluded the 2024 season when Buffalo had uh, four minor league teams. And we have now um, just added... A couple other teams. We've added the Albany Capitals, who will be in the International League as the Wings AAA affiliate. And we also added the Jamestown Jammers to give us a high A team, who will be in the South Atlantic League. So we will have six minor league teams for the upcoming 2025 season as we continue to build out our organization and next year at this time, we will be preparing for the expansion draft and getting ready to join Major League Baseball along with the Nashville Stars in 2026. When I thought about where uh, farm teams of Buffalo could go outside of the teams down in the Florida and Dominican leagues, um, more logical places would be Rochester and Syracuse. They already have long-established international league teams, and I didn't want to uh, start messing with minor league systems for multiple teams across the organization. So try to go with uh, three cities in New York that used to have affiliated minor league teams that no longer do. Jamestown and uh, most recently before they were disbanded the Jamestown Jammers you can see I've actually got a real logo there rather than the phony ones that I've uh, made up very simply in OOTP but Jamestown was a long time member of the New York Penn League and it's also a city south of, of Buffalo that uh, presumably would have a fair amount of fans who would uh, be supportive uh, Utica, also a longtime member of the New York Penn League um, through multiple organizations over the years. Uh, probably three, three and a half hours away from Buffalo, so not incredibly close. Um, and obviously Rochester and Syracuse are both closer to Buffalo and larger than Utica, but thought that that would be a logical team to give an affiliate or a logical city to give an affiliated club back to and then albany you know four and a half five hours away from uh buffalo depending on how uh quickly you want to drive on the new york state thruway but um a city that uh for a pretty good period of time had a eastern league franchise uh both the yankees and the a's back in the day so affiliated baseball coming to some uh upstate new york cities and then obviously we've got uh, teams for utica in florida and the dominican as well as we now have a minor league system that's built out obviously we're going to be needing to spend some time uh during this off season, uh, signing some more players. You can see we've shifted things out a bit, but we've only got nine players on Albany and eight uh, on Jamestown right now. Our uh, rookie league roster has gotten a little bit bloated. There could be players there that um, it's time to move up to somewhere else. We've been focusing on playing the legitimate prospects like Henry Allen, who we picked in the first round this past year, hit 308 in limited action. Uh, Owen Pano was, I believe, our 
fifth round pick. He had fifth round pick, and he hit a uh, 288 for us with five homers and 52 at bats. So good to see some production out of those two players. I probably will not be going into as much detail in this episode into international amateur free agency and the uh, baseball draft as I have in the previous two episodes just because I want to uh, ensure that I get through this episode and get to next off season because that's going to be when I've got the very tricky machinations that I'm going to need to go through to ensure this all works out where I'm going to be creating two dummy teams to do the expansion draft with and then I'm going to have to get all of those players moved to Buffalo and Jamestown delete those uh, dummy teams for the expansion draft and then I'm also going to have to uh, expand the league officially to 32 players change the um, division setup and there may actually be a team or two that are changing leagues at that time but in preparation for uh, that ultimately for the 2026 season We've also got uh, two changes to announce for the upcoming 2025 season. And uh, they are that we are moving the Las Vegas Athletics from Oakland to L.A. Uh, we've built them a stadium of about 30,000, which I believe is the amount that uh, it's expected to be calling it Tropicana Stadium because it's uh, going to be on the land owned by the Tropicana in Vegas. I uh, don't know whether that will be the actual stadium name or not. My assumption is there will probably be some sponsor involved ultimately. And what we also did um, is we bumped up the budget of the team. Uh, we bumped up fan interest and fan loyalty and the market size from where they were in Oakland and I actually improved John Fisher's personality a bit um, to try to make the situation uh, better as far as uh, finances for the team in Las Vegas than they had been in Oakland. Um, presumably there may be different ownership by the time uh, the A's are really moving to Las Vegas, and uh, although the market size fan loyalty and fan interest could conceivably be different in Vegas than they are in Oakland. Um, also felt like just uh, improving the ownership situation would allow them to hopefully be a more competitive team going forward. And the other move that we are making is we have moved the Tampa Bay Rays to Montreal and the Montreal Expos are a team once again. Uh, the Expos are going to be in the AL East this season, um, where Tampa Bay obviously was a playoff team last year. I think they will end up back in their traditional spot in the National League for the 2026 season, but I just didn't want to um, mess around with too many uh, different things Um this offseason in terms of shifting a bunch of teams from one league to another when I'm going to be doing um, something similar next offseason. So three quarters Badger, although I am not going to be the GM and manager of the Montreal Expos, the Expos are back in Major League Baseball. Uh, similar to what I did with the A's, I improved... Um, the fiscal personality of Stu Sternberg a bit and also increased fan interest and fan loyalty for the Expos to hopefully um, get them off to a good start. Also bumped their budget up um, from where it was. We'll see how this team is actually managed in the coming years, but my um, operating assumption was that hopefully with the moves from Tampa Bay and Oakland, both of um, those new franchises in Las Vegas as well as 
Montreal would be in a uh, better financial situation and a better potential attendance situation than they were in the past. We'll have to see how it all plays out, but that is the plan. So we are going to begin work on the offseason now. We've already done one round of international amateur free agency, got three more training sessions to run between now and mid-January, and uh, we're going to start uh, perusing the free agent wire to start building out our uh, full minor league system at this point. We've got six teams up and running. That is what we're going to run with uh, for the foreseeable future. So uh, we are making progress, and we are hopefully just... Uh, one season away and one episode away from an expansion draft at this point. And we've made it to the beginning of international amateur free agency. Uh, it will be interesting to see what type of strategy we approach the IAFA period with this year. Uh, last year, if you didn't happen to watch the episode, we tried to go big. Um, we picked up Andres Medina. We spent four million of the four point seven five million that we had on him, and it worked out really well because he's viewed as the number three prospect in baseball right now, uh, catcher who looks like he's going to be excellent defensively, with a potentially really interesting bat with uh, well above average contact and home run power if he completely develops as well as durability. So. Hopefully he's a guy that can be a cornerstone of this Buffalo franchise uh, for 15 seasons, starting in maybe three or four years. So the strategy is um, undetermined at this point. We're going to look at what's actually out there um, in a little more depth right now. I did like um, that the game was intuitive enough to know, even though Nashville and buffalo have not been playing in the majors for the last two years for some reason uh they knew to kind of max us out at the 5.7 million in terms of the amount that we can spend so we're with all of the teams that have really been struggling in terms of the amount that we can offer people so odds are if there's one player that we really want we can probably get him for 5.7 million uh the question is whether that's going to be our strategy or whether we're going to try to spread the money out over multiple prospects this time around. And we're going to take a look at some of the top prospects. And I am interested uh, in the comments down below, for those of you who are playing OOTP24, what your strategy is as far as the 10 players that you bring in each month to your training camps. What I've ended up kind of defaulting to is just kind of bringing in the top seven or eight position players and the top two or three pitchers and uh, getting them scouted as accurately as possible by bringing them each in four times. I haven't gotten any more uh, nuanced or strategic in terms of my plans uh, in my approach, but if uh, others have ideas on how to kind of optimize getting to know players and positioning yourselves in terms of your relationships with the top players um, by bringing them into camp in some other way. Would love to hear about it in the comments. Anyways, on to the prospects, and we'll take a look at these top six prospects here as far as the batters. Derek Boot, uh, third baseman out of the Dutch Antilles. Uh, looks like a potentially awesome bat. No speed. The glove is brutal, but the bat certainly looks very special. 6-1 uh, could play first. Definitely could be a corner outfielder, I honestly think, with the pretty mediocre range and error ratings, despite the really nice arm. I'd kind of view him as a left fielder, a right fielder, or a DH, uh, but certainly a big time uh, hitting prospect. So he's someone to think about, supposedly only looking for $1.4 million. Ambrosi Gaona, 16 year old out of Venezuela, dual Italian citizenship. Uh, another really interesting looking bat for a right fielder. 
Uh, the contact and the gap power, excellent. Unfortunately, the speed is not all that great. Jesus Lara out of the Dominican, uh, another really interesting batting prospects, well above average contact and home run power if he develops. Uh, pretty mediocre defensive outfielder, but still an interesting player. Jorge Resendez, uh, not quite the bat potential of some of the other players. Do like the high work ethic, do like the durability. A little older at 18 and a half years old than some of the other prospects. David Vergara, third base prospect. Uh, don't think he really ends up there. Probably a first baseman with those ratings. Can't really play him in the outfield. So I think first base is really where he would end up. Um, like the durability and another guy with a pretty good contact and home run power combination if he completely develops. And last but not least among the top uh, batting prospects, Willem Gillum, the Aussie first baseman. Uh, doesn't bring much to the table at all defensively, but another guy who looks like he could have a useful major league bat if uh, he develops to the maximum of his potential. With the pitchers, by virtue of our scouting accuracy, you can tell the three that we have um, brought to camps rather than just um, not just gotten scouting reports on um, Humberto Alzarenga is uh, the consensus number one international amateur free agent prospect. Certainly looks like he can be an excellent pitcher. Um, looks like he can't miss prospect as a pitcher, quite honestly. The question is whether that changeup will develop or not. He's a very high-end reliever if that changeup doesn't develop. If that changeup does develop, he can be a very high-end starter. 17 years old, already throwing in the low to mid-90s. Um, a lot to like about Alzarenga. He is looking for a lot of money, though. Similarly, Jesus Berrientos, um, also looking for a lot of money, almost $3.5 million to start. And he is definitely going to be a reliever, um, unless something really funky happens. Also, don't love some of those negative personality characteristics, given the amount of money he's looking for. Probably not a direction that we're going to go. And then Rodolfo Sico, 17-year-old out of Venezuela. Looks like he could be a useful major league pitcher if he completely develops. Um, question is whether he will. Uh, certainly looks like he could have an outstanding curveball, um, which would contribute to some really good stuff. Has enough stamina to start, without a doubt. Like the fact that he's durable. And he's also uh, looking for a lot less money than either of the other big-time uh, pitching prospects. And with that, might as well uh, check in on the one other player that we know really well, Nelson Abarca. Obviously, with that high scouting accuracy, these are the seven guys that we've been consistently bringing into camp. Uh, the catcher looks like he could have a decent bat for a catcher, like the durability plus defensive ability potentially uh, after bringing in one of the top catching prospects in the game uh, in international amateur free agency last year, though. Probably not a lever uh, we're going to really focus on pressing this time around. And moving back from my scouting screen to the default scouting screen, uh, you can importantly see the relationships we've been able to build with the players that we've been bringing into camp over the past few months. And uh, I got to make a run at Derek Boot. Uh, I just think this batting profile is potentially outstanding. Um, and I think that although he's not a third baseman, um, as a corner outfielder, you can certainly live with him. And as a DH or a first baseman, I think he'd be competent as well. But uh, this bat with that off-the-charts eye, almost off-the-charts contact, and well above average gap power, and more importantly, home run power, and even going to be a guy who um, you know strikes out at a pretty average rate despite that great power, um, 
and despite the great eye, looks like uh, a real interesting prospect. Says he's only looking for $1.4 million. I tend to think that number is going to get materially higher. We'll start him off at $1.75 million. Hope that maybe we can get lucky and he'll just sign with us before someone else offers him big money. But uh, I think that's pretty unlikely and we're going to have to be... Uh, putting some additional funds out there to try to bring him on board before all is said and done. And we're also going to throw bids out on a couple of pitchers. We're not going to go crazy right now because I do want to ensure that we um, potentially retain enough money to ensure that we can get Derek Boot on board if he's willing to... Uh, play ball with us as far as the discussions but Rodolfo Seco the 17 year old out of Venezuela who's looking for less than the other guys we're going to throw an offer out to him less than what he's allegedly wants but see if he's willing to think about maybe signing with us for a million and a half uh, similarly Jorge Carrillo is a guy that we don't really know all that well um only average scouting accuracy. We've got a weak relationship with him, but he's looking for a lot less money than some of the other top prospects. He's got that high work ethic. He's durable. The question is how good his arsenal is really going to be. He does potentially have a four to five pitch arsenal, but looks like uh, he could be relatively average. He's also a little older, almost 19 years old. So we're not going to throw a crazy offer out to him right now. If we can sign him for half a million, though, he's willing to at least think about it. So we've got a couple of real cheap, well, I don't want to say real cheap, but likely below market offers out to a couple of those pitchers. And then most importantly, we've got the offer um, out to Derek Boot more than what he's looking for. It says uh, here in the early stages that Boot and Carrillo do favor those offers, but uh, we'll see how that really plays out in the coming weeks. And not surprisingly, Derek Boot has come back, says he needs more money. Uh, our potential rivals in Nashville, the other expansion team, are offering him big money as well. Uh, says we need to get to 3.2 million to get him on board. I'll actually bump it up to three and a half, um, which still leaves us with a couple hundred thousand with the other offers we have out there. Clearly, um, if one or both of those pitchers end up declining the offers, that will open the money back up so that we could go to a full 5.7 million if necessary to get Derek Boot on board. But we'll ask him what he's thinking about this $3.5 million offer. Would love to get him locked up. And if Derek Boot comes back looking for more money, we may have ended up costing ourselves because uh, both Seiko and Carrillo signed for those offers that were less than, um, less than they were supposedly looking for. So I think we've gotten good value getting Rodolfo Seco for $1.5 million, as well as Jorge Carrillo on board for $500,000. But clearly with the $2 million that is now spent on those two, the highest we're going to be able to go for Derek Boot is $3.7 million, which is only $200,000 more than we've gone so far. My hunch is if he comes back to us looking for another offer, it's going to probably be in the $4.5 million area. So we may have cost ourselves boot by bringing on both of these pitchers. Clearly, if he comes back in the next couple of days and says that he's going to sign for $3.5 million, be a huge celebration in the war room in Buffalo, but uh, I tend to think that's probably not going to happen with him. I think we're going to probably have had to go a little higher. Um, we obviously could have just never put out offers to Seiko and Carrillo. Um, but if we do miss out on boot, you know, there are other guys that... Um, that we liked as far as position players. And when we take a look at the batters who are available, 
all the guys are still out there and the demands um, given that we've got 3.7 million dollars left seems like we could potentially be in play for some of the others so it'll be a bummer if we lose boot but I really like the two pitchers that we spent the two million dollars on and I think we got good value getting maybe two of the top five pitching prospects in this year's class into our organization. And as expected, uh, Derek Boot is looking for more money. Says he needs three point uh, nine million, which is a uh, number that we can't beat. Um, what we could try to do is make a trade to pick up some additional international amateur free agent cash from somebody. I don't really know who we have that people are going to be incredibly excited about, but it's worth an attempt. But before I go crazy on that, I do just want to see if um, maybe one of the other big-time prospects is, is a realistic approach for us. Gayona and Lara are both really good. I think I favor Gayona a bit. Resendez is solid. Vergara was solid. Willem Gillum was solid. I think I like Gayona the best, the 16-year-old out of Venezuela. What's his contract situation right now? 2.64 million. Um, I'm going to pivot a bit right now. I mean, Gayona looks like a really interesting prospect. You wish he would walk a little bit more. But contact and home run power, both potentially outstanding. He's 6'4", so he probably could play first base, even though you don't love some of those infield ratings. Actually, you don't even like some of those infield ratings. Um, it's going to take a day or two to hear back on a trade so I think what we're going to do is we're going to make an offer to Gayona for $2.65 million. And in the meantime, we're also going to see if maybe there is a prospect in our system who's not a big-time prospect that maybe we can pick up some cash from another one of these um, teams. Um, there's a lot of teams with a lot of money available still, so um, maybe we can get really creative. He can see where uh, there's only been about a dozen players signed, and we've got two of them signed. And like I said, I like those pitchers. Um, I'd still love to somehow figure out a way to get Derek Boot on board. I just don't know how realistic it's going to be to trade for some of this money, but we've got to give it a try. Well, we made an offer to the Brewers for 560000 in money, and we offered Gavin Grayevac, who we picked in the second round in our first draft in 2023. Hasn't uh, played particularly well in rookie ball and doesn't seem to be developing as much as we would hope and have the same potential we thought he might have had when we picked him up. Um, they say we're almost there to a trade, but they also said that we don't really have a player that's going to make it work. So um, I'll discuss it again, and I'll bump it down to I'll bump it down to just two hundred fifty thousand, just to see how hard it is to actually make trades for international amateur free agent money. I would assume that a second round pick from literally eighteen months ago. For just two hundred fifty thousand in international bonus money, that doesn't seem unreasonable to me. But I think these trades are pretty difficult to make. And unfortunately, even looking for a quarter of a million dollars, we got the uh, almost again. So I think it's going to be tough to make a deal. But we're going to keep working at it 
We're going to try to make it interesting. We had uh, Sainez Mani Grandal as a minor leaguer last year. He played in AA because that was our highest level. Um, 36-year-old veteran, but still obviously a very good defensive catcher with some home run power and a good eye. Um, I don't know that that gets a deal done, but we might as well see if we got a chance. Yeah, it says we're headed in the right direction, but still not sure that there's another player that makes this deal work. Um, right now, I'm just trying to learn things and whether these trades are even really possible at the trade difficulty that we're going at. So I'm going to throw in another prospect, um, not necessarily one of our top prospects, but somebody else in addition to Grayovac that may have some value. And we're going to put Arnis Rodriguez into the deal, a 21-year-old, um, not really a big-time prospect, somebody we signed as a minor league free agent at the start of this playthrough in 2023. Um, you know, maybe he could be a utility infielder for somebody, but he's relatively young. Um, I do, as those of you who have watched uh, previous playthroughs of ours, um, obviously need to be playing in commissioner mode for this playthrough with all of the funky stuff that we're doing to set this thing up. Um, so I did notice that there's this force this trade button here, but uh, I can promise you I'm not going to use that in a weaselly fashion at any time during this playthrough. That would just kind of... Uh, defeat the purpose and obviously you know if you want to just be a commissioner and force wacky stuff you can uh, build a super team that's unbeatable and probably wins 120 130 games a year but um, there's just not much challenge in that so we'll go ahead and submit this offer I don't think we're going to get where we want to be so I'm actually also going to just try to come up with a second team and make some offers to them all. So I don't think I'm going to get cash, probably almost certainly not going to get cash in enough time to um, make an offer to the top prospect that we've been focused on, but um, trying to at least learn a little bit about how this works. And hopefully if you're still watching at this point um, and you haven't played out around a ton with uh, trading for international amateur free agent money, hopefully this is helping you out a little bit as well. And we did try to make a trade to St. Louis for $2 million in pool money. In addition to Grayovac and Grand Isle, we also offered them Tony Kemp, um, as well as Jose Ailman, who's a minor league free agent that we signed, who's one of the better pitching prospects in our system, quite honestly, although he was 0-9 in rookie ball for us this year with a 7.62 ERA. Uh, his profile suggests he could become a decent pitcher, but that was a no way for $2 million just with um, that batch. We'll uh, take things down to a million and see if that uh, changes what the Cardinals are thinking about this offer. And even with a million dollars, um, we don't have a player that makes it work. So I think, unfortunately, we're... Um, not going to be able to bring on any internet, any additional international amateur free agent money. Um, Derek Boot wants more dollars, and it looks like um, we're not going to have the dollars to get him there. And uh, Gayona, haven't heard back from him. I'm guessing that means that, uh, hmm. It says our offer is not quite good enough. We had offered him $2.65 million. Says he only wants $2.6 million. That does not make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, he just wants to sign with somebody else. So he's just trying to get us to offer him more money, but he doesn't really want to come play with us. Oh, although he says $3 million, he'll think about it. So we'll see what happens. And Derek Boot is off the market. He ended up signing with the Cubs 
for $4.53 million. So uh, we could have brought him on board, uh, most likely, if we didn't go for those pitchers. Um, Gayona says he does favor our v deal right now. That could obviously change, but certainly um, would love to be able to bring a player like him on board. And not surprisingly, Ambrosi Gayona says uh, Cleveland's got a better offer on the table. And we do not have the money to get it done. So I think we may have, uh, I don't know, I mean, I like the pitchers we brought on board and we got good value on them. Obviously, I know some of you are going to be displeased with the way I handled this by not landing one of the big hitting prospects and by... Obviously, you know, if we had just went to 5.7 million, we probably could have gotten either Gayona or Boot. But um, I don't hate the pitchers that we've got on board, and there's still other options out there. Not enough money for Jesus Lara anymore. Willem Gillum. Like the work ethic. Um, Jorge Resendiz, also like the work ethic there. He's a little older prospect. We're going to make a play at, for Jorge Resendiz right now at $1.8 million. See if maybe we can bring him on board. I don't like the way that these guys say they'll sign for a certain amount. And then uh, you have to give them even more to get them interested. But it is what it is. And Jorge Resendiz has gotten back to us. Says he's looking for more money, not surprisingly. Um, says $3.2 million will get it done. I think we're just going to offer him everything that we can possibly offer at this point. If we give him 37 that will use up every penny that we had this year. So we'll make a strong play for him. Um, that would give us, you know, one of the top five or six hitters in addition to two of the top five or six pitchers is if we're able to get him on board. Obviously, he's not as high-end as those three five-star prospects, at least theoretically not as high-end as those guys. Um, but... Uh, if we could bring him on board with those two pitchers, I think it'll still be a pretty good international amateur free agent period for Buffalo. And we're still waiting to hear back from Resendiz on that deal, but Ambrosi Gaona signed with Atlanta. He ended up going for uh, $4.5 million as well. So um, pretty rare, it seems, for a player to get the full... 4.75, much less 5.7 or five and a quarter that some teams can spend. But um, Gayona and uh, the other top prospect, um, whose name I've already forgotten because I move on pretty quickly. Boot, that's right, Derek Boot. Um, Still both um, got in that $4.5 million range. But you can see uh, starting pitcher Fabio Choro got $5 million from Pittsburgh. Um, and I don't really think he's a materially more interesting prospect than the guys that we got for $2 million combined. So I do think we got good value, but I'll feel a lot better about this uh, international amateur free agent period if we are able to ultimately land Resendiz to join those two top pitchers. And we did get Jorge Resendiz on board. So I think I think it's a good international amateur free agent period. Obviously he got most of the money, 3.7 million, uh, like the high work ethic, like the durability. He's not a great defensive outfielder. He is 6'4", so he could also play first base. 
But if we can get him completely developed, 65 contact and 65 home run power with average-ish to slightly above average gap power eye and avoiding strikeouts is certainly a pretty useful offensive player. Now he is older, um, be 19 years old in June, but I think he's an interesting prospect. Um, and as I said, getting him on board uh, along with Seiko and Carrillo, who are two pretty interesting pitching prospects. Um, Seiko, you know, if that curveball develops, certainly has the profile of a starter with really good stuff and averageish movement and control, good durability. And then Carrillo potential four or five pitch arsenal. I don't think he's quite as high end if he peaks out, but with that high work ethic and that durability, he certainly looks like he could be a pretty useful back of the rotation starter. So no guarantee that any of these guys develop, but I um, like the way we kind of supplemented the superstar prospect last year in Andres Medina with three guys who I think could be um, pretty pretty useful major league players if they develop as we hope they do. And you can see we've been signing some other minor leaguers who have just been being dumped to our FCL and our DSL teams. But when we get uh, closer to the beginning of spring training, obviously we will be moving those guys to Albany and Utica and Jamestown and Marathon to ensure that uh, we can have a full and effective minor league system this year. And we've made it through spring training. Our wings were 5-21 and 21 with our uh, certainly not quite ready for the major league talent on our roster and in our organization, but players did get a little bit of practice competing against the major leaguers from other teams. And uh, now it's time to get ready for uh, one final season of minor league action through the Wings organization. Um, Obviously, we've got a lot of work to do. We had 60 players in spring training, just moved them all to AAA, uh, but clearly we're not going to be running with a 60-man roster in Albany. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do to uh, get some additional people into the Utica and Jamestown rosters or onto those rosters and even more in Marathon and then get some players off of the Capitals and uh, out of our rookie league teams. But at least we have bodies in our organization at this point. And some of them are pretty darn good prospects. And we've made it to opening day. And as you can see, our wings have no major league schedule this year. So we've uh, once again been able to successfully follow the rules as outlined by Zen Master 61 to hopefully uh, ensure that we set up this realistic expansion somewhat realistically. So we've got one season of pure minor league baseball ahead of us for the Buffalo Wings organization. And uh, really the big activity over the rest of this episode is just going to be the uh, amateur draft. And as we get ready for the season to begin, our minor league system ranks 13th. Uh, the only top 100 prospect, Andres Medina, and we have promoted him to the DSL. He's going to turn 18 years old in a few months. I uh, think it's time to start seeing what uh, the big-time prospect can potentially do for us against uh, real action outside of the international complex. Taking a look at the organization more broadly, uh, Jace Barofin, uh, number one pick in our first draft in 2023, split last year between A and AA. He's going to get a chance in the IL and AAA for Albany this year with our newly established AAA team and think that uh, he should be a 
corner outfielder and in the starting lineup for us at the major league level next year. We've also made a number of signings um, of guys to minor league contracts, uh, some of whom are pretty well-regarded players who are going to be in AAA with us this year. Certainly would think that some of these players, if they stay in our organization, will have the opportunity to be on the major league team next year. Tony Kemp, Seth Brown, Kike Hernandez, Cole Tucker, Hunter Dozier, Gio Urshela, Colton Wong. Uh, we still have Kurt Casale and Yasmani Grandal. Pitching, um, we are much lighter, as you can see. Not that the star ratings are perfect, but um, Martin Perez, Cody Sedlock, um, Luke Weaver may prove to be useful. And we've actually got a fair amount of um, somewhat known pitchers on our IL at this point. Probably the most well-known would be Dylan Bundy at this point. So um, have some talent in AAA. As I mentioned, when we look at our DSL team, we brought up our catcher, uh, Andres Medina, the number five prospect in baseball, as well as Jorge Resendiz, who was our big uh, position player signing among international amateur free agents just a few months ago. Looking at our uh, rookie league team, we're going to have Henry Allen, our first round pick from last year. Gavin Grayavac, our second round pick in 2023, kind of highlighting that roster. Uh, not a ton of other big time prospects at a lot of these other levels, quite honestly. Um, you know, I think the guys that we mentioned, Alan Grayavac, Medina Resendez, and then clearly Jace Barofin are probably the. Uh, players that we've picked in the draft or international amateur free agency over the last couple of seasons who are most likely to eventually end up uh, helping us at the major league level. And we've made it to mid-season. The draft is just a few days away. Hopefully we're ready to do some damage there. You can see Andres Medina still considered the fifth best prospect in baseball. He's off to a relatively slow start in rookie ball, hitting just 206 and 63 at bats. Uh, that said, he's not even 18 years old yet, so he's certainly holding his own at a professional level. Uh, Derek Boot, the guy who uh, we thought about trying to sign and tried to sign is uh, the number one prospect in all of baseball. So certainly would that would have been a uh, really nice addition to our system, but it is what it is at this point. Hopefully uh, the center fielder that we picked up or uh, a couple of the young pitchers that we picked up, hopefully we'll hit on some of them over the next several seasons. Taking a look at player development, we went 12th overall, uh, Andres Medina, the fifth prospect in baseball right now. Uh, Sean Sullivan is our only other top 200 prospect. Um, Jorge Resendiz, this center fielder that we did pick up, hitting just a buck 35 in rookie ball for us. So he clearly uh, has some work to do with 28 strikeouts in just 53 at-bats. And then Jay Sparofin, uh, his introduction to AAA thus far, hitting 295 with 15 homers and 308 at-bats. Looks like he could still develop a little bit as far as his gap power and his avoiding strikeouts. Uh, but he certainly does look like he is going to be ready to make his major league debut. He is uh, probably a starting left or right fielder for us, depending on what we end up doing in the expansion draft and what we end up doing in free agency in this upcoming offseason. Uh, but certainly going to ensure that uh, Barofin is in the lineup every day for us somewhere as uh, the first homegrown Buffalo Stars player. Or Buffalo Wings player. Nashville is the Stars. Buffalo, home of the Chicken Wings. And taking a quick look at the major league standings, uh, the moves to Montreal and Las Vegas seem to be treating um, the former Rays and the former Oakland A's pretty well so far. 
uh, looking at the financials for Oakland, uh, they've got a ton of money to spend, but fan interest is really strong, selling out pretty much every game in Las Vegas. Uh, the Expos, who made the World Series last year, is the Tampa Bay Rays, arguably uh, even better. Um, fan interest has dipped a bit somehow, but um, they've been selling out almost every game in Montreal as well. So uh, those two franchises who have moved to new locales this season, uh, both doing pretty well so far. And I had... Um, given the Las Vegas A's the traditional Oakland A's logo, but I guess because they have the name of uh, the former AAA team here, they've uh, come up with a funkier logo for the uh, A's going forward. I don't really know where that came from. Um, I don't know why they changed that on me, but um, as much as I would like to... Um, straighten out this episode um can we get the old a's logo back doesn't look like it um something i can focus on down the line not the top priority at this point uh, we've got the draft coming up and then hopefully we will uh add some talent there and uh get ready for Major League Action in Buffalo in 2026. And did also, though, before the draft, just want to check in on our uh, farm teams. Our AAA team, the Albany Capitals, is actually doing pretty well. 50 and 37 records, second place. As uh, you saw a few minutes ago when we started off the season, we've got a lot of pretty proven major league players, particularly in terms of batters on that team. Utica Club, named after the very mediocre beer, not doing so well in double A. Uh, the Jamestown Jammers having a brutal year in high A ball. Uh, the Marathon Keys not doing well in single A in the FSL. And then our rookie uh, Wings team is 11 and 15 in the FCL. We are uh, hanging on at 500 in the DSL thus far. So hopefully uh, can get some better performances going forward and hopefully especially bolster that FCL team with the players that we're going to be picking in the draft shortly. And in both 2023 and 2024, uh, we had the expansion stars and wings picking in the early 20s ahead of only the playoff teams. Uh, this year, our final season before we have a major league team, uh, we're going to have Nashville and Buffalo picking 11th and 12th. And then next year, when we have our first major league season, we're going to have Buffalo and Nashville picking at the top of the draft as a way to uh, generate some even more interest among their fan bases for the hopefully uh, high-end prospects that uh, both teams will get in 2026. And I'm only going to go through the first couple rounds of the draft this year because... Uh, I want to get this episode done, and more importantly, I want to get the next episode where I'm going to be doing all of the real complicated stuff to see if this really works out done uh, as soon as possible so I can start posting these first four episodes of the series and really getting some feedback from all of you viewers as to uh, what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, and what you'd like me, what you'd like to see me try to do with these buffalo wings over the next uh, several seasons so um not a ton of high-end pitching prospects out there you can see uh, even at the 12th pick in the draft according to our scout there's not even a three-star potential pitcher out there a little more high-end talent on the batter side uh, dean moss the left fielder coming out of img academy but committed to vanderbilt looks like a Pretty decent hitting prospect with potentially excellent home run power. Uh, not the most exciting fielder, pretty mediocre uh, infielder or outfielder, but certainly has nice power. Masato Chilcut, a catcher. Uh, looks like above average defensively, pretty good speed for a catcher. 
Um, it looks like he could have a useful-ish major league bat. Almost 19 years old. Uh, Cannon Golden, another 19-year-old prospect, a right fielder. Uh, looks like a pretty average-ish type prospect. Um, nothing all that exciting there either. And last but not least, among the only three-star and higher prospects available, Xavier Nans. Uh, don't love the low leadership and low intelligence. Uh, certainly the bat looks like it could be a useful major league bat if he completely develops. Our scouting director recommends we go with Dean Moss. Um, certainly that potential 70 home run power and that potentially 60 I are attractive features. Um, we're going to spend a little time looking around, just making sure that we're not missing out on any other really high-end prospects before we make a decision here in round number one. And our scout says Dean Moss is the guy to go with. He says he's the highest potential player available, and from looking around, um, I think that that's the case. Um, not a great fielder by any stretch of the imagination. He's going to be a corner outfielder, a DH, or a mediocre first or third baseman. But uh, that bat is potentially interesting, and I think it's the best opportunity we've got. Also pretty interesting with his bonus demand and with the uh, way that we're swimming in money since we're not paying any major league salaries. We do have the opportunity to uh, maybe pick up a player or two in the second and third round who drop because they're looking for a ton of money. So we're going to go ahead and uh, Dean Moss is going to be joining the Buffalo organization. And the second round recommendation is uh, Xavier Nans, who we looked at last round. As I talked about, I don't love the low leadership and intelligence. Um, think I may go in a different direction. Um, Vaughn Necker is a guy that I like. Um, looks like a pretty respectable prospect. Uh, could be a first or third baseman, but also going to take a look at some of the um, pitching prospects that are left and see if any of these um, guys stand out to me as a potential pitcher to pick here in the early part of the second round. And there wasn't really much of interest as far as the pitchers, so uh, you know, kind of just searching for players who have a decent combination of contact, power potential, eye potential. Nayans, who our scout recommends, is there. Carlos Elian Martinez kind of is there, but I think I am going to go with Vaughn Necker. He's uh, as good as Martinez and better than Nayans in gap power. He's better than both of them in power potential, better than both of them in eye potential. And uh, Nayans does stand out with his contact potential. But as I talked about, I don't love the low leadership and intelligence. And he's not so much better a prospect than um, Necker is in my mind that uh, I'm... Um, feeling forced to go with Nayan. So we're going to go with Necker here in the second round of the draft. Third round of the draft here, we're going to go with Jason Jones, um, another hitting prospect. Not great defensively, not great in terms of his speed, but could have plus home run power. Um, Coming out of the University of Arkansas, almost 22 years old, so a bit older prospect, and we will go with him here in round number three. And our scouting director in the fourth round is recommending Luke Papano, who's been a guy that we've looked at. He's one of the few two-and-a-half star pitching prospects. Um, we haven't uh, obviously pulled the trigger on him uh, in these early rounds of the draft and clearly nobody else has either but he is the only two and a half uh, star prospect left at this point um, he looks like a number five starter um, he is a guy who can also play the outfield and when we look at his batting ratings um, you know looks like he could be a competent 
offensive player as well. So we will have an option to decide, hey, should this guy become a pitcher? Should this guy become a hitter? So kind of a interesting prospect for us to take a flyer on. We will uh, follow our scouts recommendation here in round number four and welcome the first pitcher of the draft into the Buffalo Wings organization by bringing uh, Mr. Luke Papano on board here in round number four. And the draft is over. We ended up going with a shortstop, Giovanni Colasante. Uh, in the fifth round, you can see nobody with really high demands. So uh, should be able to get all of these players signed pretty easily. Didn't really take advantage of the uh, extra money that we've got available this year, given that we don't have any major league salaries. But uh, we took what came to us in the draft, and I think that... Um, Moss, Necker, and Jones are a pretty good start as our top three players. And Papano certainly has some potential. Um, you know, a high school pitcher is a roll of the dice. Uh, we'll hope that uh, he doesn't come up snake eyes for us. And we've made it to the end of the regular season. Uh, you can see the Montreal Expos, the former Tampa Bay Rays and the Houston Astros have the buys in the American League. The Cincinnati Reds and the Atlanta Braves with the buys in the National League. And uh, the Las Vegas Athletics, the former Oakland Athletics, could be uh, potentially going up against the Expos, which would be a uh, interesting ALDS with the two teams that uh, moved locations in this past offseason. Taking a look at our Buffalo Wings organization and how the minor league year went. Albany Capitals, 90 and 60 record, uh, first place in their division in the IL. Double A Utica Club, a rough year. High A ball, Jamestown Jammers, a brutal season. Single A Marathon Keys, not much better. The uh, FCL rookie team was close to respectable, and the DSL rookie team was uh, a little worse. So not an impressive minor league performance when all was said and done, but I do like the fact that we've got a little bit of talent at the AAA level because uh, I would have to think that some of those players are going to be uh, pretty helpful to us next season when we are an official expansion team in Major League Baseball. And taking a look at our organization, uh, Minor League System ranks 14th out of 32, so I guess we've made some progress over the three seasons during which we built out this um, Minor League System. For comparison, let's take a look at Nashville, and I have no idea what the answer is going to be here. They could be first, they could be 30th, but that would be the team for us to compare ourselves to. And they rank 26th in terms of their organization. So I guess you could argue that we've um, at least done a better job than the AI-managed uh, team that started building its farm system at the same time that we did. Um so that's something. Taking a look at our organization, uh, Andres Medina, the international amateur free agent that we signed uh, two years ago, hit just a buck seventy uh, in his first hundred and forty-one at bats, largely as a seventeen-year-old in rookie ball. Potential-wise, still looks like an excellent defensive catcher. If he can, you know, get the contact and home run power developed to the extent our scout thinks he can, he still looks like he could be a very valuable player for us to uh, really aid our pitching staff in a few seasons. Sean Sullivan is a guy who we picked in the second round of the draft a year ago. He did not do much uh, in rookie ball in 2024. But uh, he was a 22-year-old player out of college, uh, close to 23 years old. So we just moved him right up to AAA this year. And uh, he had a nice year for us, 12-6 and six with a 374 ERA. Certainly would expect that he will be uh, part of our pitching staff at the major league level next year. 
Jorge Carrillo is an international amateur free agent signing from this past year. One of the uh, two pitchers that we signed at the beginning of this episode, one and eight with an 874 ERA in the DSL for us. So not good there. Jorge Resendiz, who we also picked up uh, at the start of this episode in international amateur free agency, hit just a buck 42 in his first uh, rookie ball experience. So a lot of uh, improvement needed there. Guy who doesn't need to improve too much, Jace Barofin, first round draft pick of ours in 2023. Spent the whole year in AAA where he hit 312 with 29 homers and 101 ribbies. As we have talked about, uh, our expectation is that Barofin is going to be a corner outfielder for us and probably batting right in the middle of our order. And I would think that the uh, fans in Buffalo are going to like the uh, homegrown talent of the player who was uh, picked in the draft uh, in 2023 with the first pick ever by this Buffalo franchise. And uh, he could very well be the cleanup hitter for the uh, Buffalo Wings when they begin playing in Major League Baseball in the 2026 season. Uh, Just to look at a couple other prospects. Justin Laguernick is a pitcher we took in the third round back in our first draft. Still hasn't made it out of rookie ball, but he was at least respectable this year, going 5-4 and four with a 450 ERA. We'll likely move him up to A ball next season. And Henry Allen was our first round draft pick in 2024. Uh, hit 249 with seven homers in a full season in rookie ball this year. He also is likely headed to Class A next year. Uh, take a look at just a couple other pitchers. Ethan Robinson, fifth round pick from 2023, four and three, five point three seven in rookie ball this year. But he's 21 years old. Probably got to move him up to A ball next year just to see if we have anything with him. Uh, Cal Randall out with a torn UCL for nine months. He was 2-0 with a 364 ERA in rookie ball before that injury curtailed his season. Uh, But the former sixth round draft pick is now also 20 years old. And he will likely be in A ball next year. So at least we're... I think making a little bit of progress with some of the uh, prospects that we've picked up over the last few seasons. And in a bit of a surprising result, your 2025 World Series champions are the Cleveland Guardians. Went from the wild card all the way to a World Series title ending a very long drought in the city of Cleveland as far as Major League Baseball World Series championships. But they did beat the Phillies uh, to claim the 2025 World Series. And with that, our episode is over. And uh, in the coming episode, we are going to begin the off season. We have finally uh, built up a minor league system. I don't want to say it's a great minor league system. We haven't been good on the field. And uh, we're upper middle of the pack, I would say, with a 12th rated system. Uh, You can see after the playoffs, though, we actually have four players ranked in the top 200 now. So, uh, Obviously, it's all centered on Medina becoming what we think he can become, but um, we've got some players that uh, could be helping us in the majors next year, uh, particularly Sean Sullivan and Jace Bahrofen. And we'll find out in the next episode uh, whether the expansion draft goes well for us and whether I'm able to kind of... uh, follow all of the rules in this final key step to get the uh, Buffalo Wings and the Nashville Stars organizations established. And if that goes well, our playthrough will be well underway. So uh, wish me luck as I work on that next episode. And uh, hopefully we'll get through the expansion draft. Uh, We're going to have some other work to do. We're also going to need to reorganize the league. 
and uh, we've also got some uh, roles to fill. We actually had a, a pitching or a manager who just retired. I thought it was a pitching coach, but Byron Nichols we had hired as a manager. So we're going to be looking for a manager down with our rookie league team. Uh, most importantly, we need to come up with a bench coach, a pitching coach, a hitting coach, a first base coach, and a third base coach for our Major League Buffalo Wings franchise. And certainly I feel like we've got some good prospects across our minor league organization that could help us there. Uh, but we'll work on putting together hopefully a high quality and cohesive major league coaching staff by hopefully extracting a few guys and promoting a few guys in our system, bringing on a couple other uh, big time coaches to hopefully help us uh, build the team and the organization. And uh, we could be ready to run pretty shortly. Like I said, the big three things in the next episode are going to be building the coaching staff, reorganizing the league into a 32-team structure with the official additions of Nashville and Buffalo, and uh, doing the expansion draft for the Nashville Stars and our Buffalo Wings. And we'll see how that all goes in our next episode. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and hope you have a great day.